email address is up. Somebody asked me if I accept emails. I love emails, so if you have any questions, want to talk about anything, feel free. I mean, I enjoy. It. I like this stuff. I enjoy what I, what, what I do. So this is this is styled um, cybercrime challenges for law enforcement. Um, this is something that 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 I've been working on quite a bit. Several things I've been working on, and basically, I guess the theme is that cybercrime is different. Okay. It's, it's different in, in, in certain ways. It's different kind of tricky, intangible ways. And the tricky, intangible ways pro pose problems for the way we have conducted law enforcement and the criminal law. And I want to talk about that and illustrate some of the ways that it's different. In doing that, I really don't have an agenda. I mean, what I find interesting is how technology impacts on a lot of our assumptions in law. Law tends to be conservative, it's traditional, and I think that of all the areas of law, criminal law is probably the most primitive, the oldest, because if you think about it, it, deals with, it has dealt, used to deal with, you know, really basic things. I walk up to you and hurt you, something like that. And that's got to deal with all these technological things, and we've got a lot of lawyers and judges who aren't particularly adept with it, and so we're trying to sort it out. So let's, let's talk. Um, well, that's what I just said. Um, that what you have for criminal law is you have a system that evolved to deal with bank robberies and murders and homicides and rapes and thefts and those kinds of things, you know, what I call real-world crime, which has certain characteristics that we'll talk about that you don't necessarily have in cybercrime. So we'll get to that. Cybercrime, computer-mediated crime, technologically-mediated crime, technological crime, whatever you want to call it, is different. It, it doesn't operate under some of the same constraints, and that can cause issues. And we're going to do an illustration here, and we'll progress on to some more. Here's one, theft. This is such a simple one. Theft, real world theft. Possession of property shifts completely from A to B. A had it, B now has it. I take your laptop. Real world theft, I walk up to you, I take your laptop, I have it, you don't. It's a zero sum concept. Yeah, that's the way it's always been. Cyber theft can happen like that, but it can also happen that property data is copied. So not everybody has it. Both people have it. And that can raise issues in terms of the legal system. Here's a case from Oregon. A gentleman named Randall Schwartz worked for Intel. And for reasons I really don't know, he became aggravated with Intel. Um, and in the course of being aggravated with his employer, he apparently copied um, a file that contained passwords. He was charged with computer theft for copying the file that contained passwords. And he said, come on now. Theft is depriving someone of the possession use of their property. Theft is taking away the laptop. I didn't take anything away. Intel still has the password file. There's no theft, which is true in terms of traditional legal principles, but we've had to, we've had to expand that out. Now, in this country, we've done a pretty good job at state and federal level of expanding out on some things like that, intangible property, this kind of theft. You still have problems with that in some other countries, which is something I'll get to, because Cybercrime is international, and that creates, that creates issues. Um, here, this is the flip side of what I just did. First issue is copying files theft. Is Randall Schwartz copying the password file a theft? It's not theft in that sense, but it's the idea being that Intel lost something, that there's a dilution of their property, a dilution of the value that they lost something. Here's another place where copying files comes up, seizure. Fourth Amendment probably now. Fourth Amendment, you have a right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures. If you don't have a search or seizure, you don't have the Fourth Amendment. It's not a Fourth Amendment search for a police officer to drive down the street and videotape you, because it's not private. It's not a search. All right? You've got to have a search or seizure to get into the window, and that means that if you get in the window, then they have to use a warrant. They have to comply with the Fourth Amendment. If you're outside the Fourth Amendment, no warrant, no nothing. You videotape on the street. You don't need a warrant. It's not a search. Here, copying files. A question that is not resolved, that's been addressed in a federal case I'm going to talk about a little bit later, but I think that federal case is really wrong. Um, a question that has not been resolved is whether or not copying files is a seizure. And that's important, because if copying files is a seizure, it means the Fourth Amendment's implicated, and it means the government can't do it without a warrant or an exception to the warrant requirement. If it's not, if it's not a seizure, None of, that, none of that kicks in. There is a federal case that I'll talk about in a bit that, that handled this issue badly. This is an issue that's on appeal in a case out of Illinois, 
where a fellow took his computer into the repair shop to have something done. Um, they were authorized to look at one file. They looked at one file. They saw something that look, looked look like child porn. They called the cops. The cops came in. The cops copied everything on the hard drive. On the, on the motion to the stand, the motion was suppressed, and the officer was asked, why didn't you get a warrant? He said, I don't like to do that. It takes time. <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> why would you do that? Question being, which becomes critical there, they copied the files, then they did other things. It comes up in the other case. If copying the files is a nothing, if it's not a seizure, it's OK. I think it has to be a seizure. I think we have to bring that within the Fourth Amendment, which is why I've done some work on the case in, case in Illinois. But it is an example. It is another example of how the law has to figure out how to deal with these technical issues. And most lawyers are not technical people. As one left. Um, I mean, this is just a version of that. This is the same kind of thing. Nikki Scarf, I don't know if you know, Nikki Scarf, a low-level gangster, uh, New Jersey, the, comes from an eminent crime family. The FBI executed a warrant at his office. They seized files from his computers. They went through the files in his computers. They found one that was encrypted. They were very suspicious about what was in the, in the encrypted file. They used a keystroke logger pursuant to a warrant to go in and get his passphrase so they could go into the file. I mean, and one of the issues there in their application for the warrant, they basically concede that copying, copying is a seizure. But let us move on. Now, this, this, the way lawyers think about, we talk about cyber crimes, you will typically see them divided into three categories. Crimes for the computer is the target. Crimes through the computer is a tool. Crimes through the computer plays an incidental role. This distinction comes from the Department of Justice has a, um, on their website, the CSIPS, uh, which is the Computer Crime Intellectual Property section, has guidelines for searching and seizing computers. If you haven't looked at it, you might want to look at it sometime because they're pretty instructive. Because of the Department of Justice talking about what you have to do to be able to search and seize computers pursuant to the Fourth Amendment Act for other things. This comes from those guidelines, and I think it's not a bad way to talk about it. It's not a really great distinction, because sometimes you can have these things intermingled. But I like to use it because I think it illustrates, I can use it to illustrate some differences in legal issues and cybercrime. Now, computer's target. First up, what I've done is put some kinds of ways computers can be targets up there, and I'm using two words. I'm using hacking and cracking, because I don't know what else to use. I know that there's, I'm not using hacking pejoratively. If you notice in parentheses, I've got trespass. Hacking for the law is a form of trespass. Hacking means that you've gone somewhere you're not supposed to be. You haven't physically gone there, but you've accessed it. And so, for lack of a better term, I'm using hacking for that. Cracking, which could be aggravated hacking, you'll see that in some criminal statutes. I'm using that as, it is the equivalent of real world burglary. Burglary is you break in somewhere to do something bad. You break in to steal, you break in to hurt, you break in to do something. So it's kind of like burglary. Malicious code, uh, we don't quite have anything an an analog to that. Website defacement, which is kind of like vandalism, denial of service attacks, which doesn't have anything after it because it doesn't have any analog in real world crime. Now let me talk about, a little bit about targets, which are the less, less interesting. Oh, this is a guy who worked for a, a company called Lance. They make little snacks. Um, he was supposed to develop a software program for them, like Randall Schwartz. They did something. They had a misunderstanding. He got unhappy with them. And because of that, he uh, planted a logic bomb in the program. He triggered it. It shut down handheld computers, cost them over $100,000. I do this one a lot. Not something you would be surprised at. But often people um, that I talk to, law enforcement, government, private sector people, don't think about the insider threat. They think about threats coming from outside. So this is a classic insider threat. This one, um, I use it, the denial of services. You know, this is the classic one. We have Mafia Boy taking the rap for this, pleading guilty for this attack. Um, it's a denial of service. It's an example. Denial of service doesn't fit in any of our criminal categories. Denial of service is not theft. It's not extortion. It's not trespass. It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit nicely into any of our categories. So it's a new crime. It's something we have to come up with a new offense for. Now, the reason I do this one, estimated $1.7 billion in damage. We don't have any idea about damage assessments. We're really, this is, this is something that's fluid. You see a lot of these assessments. I put the figure up. That's the figure that was reported. We have a lot of 
I'll do a little bit more with this later. We have a lot in terms of cybercrime statistics. We have a lot of uncertainty. Um, get to the ones. These are the ones. Now, computers target. We've got the break-ins. We've got the denial service. We've got malicious code. We've got those kinds of things. You're going at the computer. Denial service is different. Those are a little different. You know, we can make them sound like trespass and burglary, but they're a little different. This, this is where, this is the growth industry. This is where we see a lot of things happening. The computer being used as a tool to commit all kinds of neat kinds of crime. We have not, maybe you have, I have not yet discovered a documented case of cyber homicide, but computers are used to commit fraud, theft, extortion, stalking, child porn, forgery, etc., 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 just like a gun. The computer is used as a weapon to commit the crimes. Now, on the one hand, on the one hand, that may not cause problems. Sometimes it doesn't cause problems. On the other hand, sometimes it can cause us real problems in the legal system. And at this point, I'm just talking about us figuring out what the heck is the crime? Was there a crime? What was the crime? We're going to talk about procedural issues in a minute. So here it's just used as a tool to commit an existing crime. When I say cybercrime is different, there's a few differences on the targets. These are just people doing the same things they've done to people for years and years and years, but they're using the computer. And we're going to continue to see this, I think, perhaps morphing into new forms. I think we may see some different varieties here. The only reason I do this one. Levin took responsibility for siphoning money out of Citibank and putting it in foreign accounts. He's sentenced. This is computer theft, but it's not like Randall Schwartz. This is the old zero sum kind of theft. This is transferring money out of an account. This is using the computer. Those problems for us in terms of the substance of the law, but it's going to get us into procedural issues, which we'll do in a minute. Uh, identity theft, this one you probably, I'm sure you read about, the Abraham Abdullah stole, in quotes, identities of various people and steal them. I mean, identity theft. I don't take your identity and you don't have it anymore, so now I'm you and you're just not really anybody. Um, it's a form of fraud. And it's, it's, it's not a new crime. I mean, it's a different way of doing, but it's not a new kind of, it's not a new kind of crime. Um, and, you know, if you use public library, it doesn't require a lot of sophistication. This one, I like. Some of these slides are up here just because I like them. <laughs> just because I think it's funny. This is a dentist named Bruce Lachaud. He was a very trusting person. Bruce Lachaud wanted to buy some kind of a BMW. I don't know anything about BMWs, but it's a special BMW, and you can only buy it, I guess, in Germany. And Bruce really, really, really wanted this BMW. And so he was dealing with someone in Germany to buy the BMW, and they said, hey, Bruce, you're going to have to send us 55000 for the BMW. And Bruce said, oh, sure. Uh, where should I send it, basically? And they said, we should send it to this website, this escrow site. They'll take good care of it. And Bruce sends it to the escrow site, and what happens? BMW? No BMW, no 55,000. We have a sadder, but hopefully a wiser Bruce who's going to have to fill a lot of teeth to get his money back. <laughs> this one is another one I like. This was a year or so ago. Somebody hacks into an online casino and fixes it so that everybody paying craps and slots couldn't lose. <laughs> Isn't that great? I call this one the Robin Hood. I mean, Robin Hood just drops in the casino and says, hey, everybody, have a good time. Um, during the time that the, that the fix was in, that the, the thing was working, players won $1.9 million, and they actually paid up. And when I do this one for, for law enforcement or government people, I say, so is that a crime? What's the crime? All right, like a theft of services? Well, but see, stealing of the money, see, the way we think about stealing, we're, the, we're just the law. The way we think about stealing of the law is I take, I get it. I steal it for me. But if you, if, you, if you went to every teller in the bank and said to them, when someone comes in, take $100, give them 1000 it's, it's no different. That's what you've done the same thing. Yeah. I'm sorry, yes, sir. Because it's the same thing as a, like, as you're up your bill along, you just, you just walk away. 
Well, yeah. I mean, obviously the players the players didn't commit any crime, right? I mean, they didn't. They just they just they're just golden. <laughs> they didn't do anything. They're like, woohoo! Uh, no, no, I don't. I don't think so. See. I mean, because then, if you can do it, we can fit it into it. That's why I like this. We can fit it into our... I just think it was somebody having... And I, you know, I shouldn't say this right. But, I mean, having a good time. I think it's kind of funny. Reallocation of wealth. Yes? I kind of see it as somebody going into a bank relating to, like, an ordinary crime. Someone going into a bank and throwing the money out on the street to whoever walked by. Ah? Ah? That's a crime. That's a crime to keep that money. Well, he robbed the bank. Oh, it's a crime to keep the money. But did, these people didn't know. Those people knew it was. They knew it was a bank robbery. He's got a mask and the gun, right? And they're figuring out that he's a robbery. Yeah, but they just see the money flying out on the street. I don't think those. People but they didn't win it. They didn't. Was it the trouble? You can see the trouble here. There he robs it and he takes the laptop. He takes it, and then he gives it away. I'm sorry. The po um, In terms of. I don't know. I know that they paid up because they figured that it apparently was their fault and it was easier to pay up on that one than not. Um, I don't know. But as I say, the reason I use this one is when I do it for like one, actually when I do it for one person, I get it, they kind of think it's funny too. Um, but, you know, it's not theft. I mean, I'm so, I don't, you know, with all respect to your opinions, it's not the way we think of it. Uh, well, you, you see, we can, we, we can do it we can do it consequentially. I mean, I can do this one consequentially. I can do it at a lower level. I can charge you with, you know, um, destruction of property. What have you done to the slot machine? So I can get you for that, which you can get here, right? I mean, one crime you can get here is breaking into the system, right, and altering and altering. But the question is, see, you know, criminal law is supposed to be about harm. And each crime is supposed to address a particular level of harm. This is what you did. You did this bad thing, and this is the crime. All right, well, we, we can clearly here do the break into the system, right? All right, but then what about the 1.9 million? Pardon? I don't think so. I don't think so in this one. Apparently, apparently this one is straight Robin Hood. Now, there are different versions of this. Did they catch the I don't think so. Robin, you don't catch Robin Hood. Come on. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Yes. I don't do torts. I do. I'm purely criminal. <laughs> crime is crime is my interest. Oh yes. You can always do. See, and on this kind of thing, actually, I've had people ask that before. On this kind of thing, yes, you could always do. You can always do a civil suit, tort law breach of contract, the experiment agreement, whatever, you can always do that. And a casino would have money, so you could get damages. Problem is, on some of these cases, which we're going to talk about in a minute, they're what the law calls judgment proof. You can bring a civil suit. I can bring a civil suit. If I've got the money to hire a lawyer, take the whole damn thing through court, and I have somebody who's got no money. Now, I could do that. I'm just really bound and determined. I was in France about six weeks ago, and somebody told me about someone who'd pursued a suit through for a couple of years and got one dollar in damages and was quite happy because they'd vindicated themselves. I don't, I'm an American, we're mercenary. I don't think I <laughs> quite see doing that. Yes? If this was like an offshore casino, I don't know if it was or not, but who would have venue? Ah, oh, yes, we're going to get there. See, that's another whole, that's another whole thing. I mean, in terms of where is it, who's, who is jurisdiction, where is it, who's got jurisdiction, whose laws applied, you know, were the laws that were there, did they reach the conduct, that's just another whole thing. This is just a real simple little conceptual part of it, which is somebody plays a trick, you want to prosecute, you can clearly prosecute for the, you can pr clearly prosecute for the intrusion, the going into the system, but then there's, that's what I mean by consequential, you're going in plus, you're breaking in plus. You're breaking in, plus you're just handing out $1.9 million. Um, a federal prosecutor tell me that this ought to be a wire fraud. <laughs> I'm not sure that you can make it. I'm not sure you can make it wire fraud. I don't think it fits. I don't think it fits no there. Hmm? No intent. To? You have to show intent to be convicted of wire fraud. 
Yeah, you have to show that you that you that you that you willfully acted, that your conduct acted, use the wires in furtherance of the scheme to defraud. And one of the problems I have with this is scheme to defraud who out of what? Scheme to defraud who out of what? Huh? Yeah, I mean, it, it, I, 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 you know, this is why. Oh yes. Yeah, because see, but in, and again, see, you're all abs you're absolutely right. And the reason I do it is, you know, we've just got this theory that because it's the way people do things in the real world, very seldom do people go rob banks in the real world and go out and go yippee, take them, take the money. It's mine. You know, theft is mine. Um, you don't have it here. You can play. You can play a trick here, and it doesn't quite fit into our categories. Let me try some more. Ah, uh, this one. This one's fun. This one is bizarre. 1999, October 1999, April 1999 is Columbine. October 1999, something happened at a Massachusetts middle school. The kids at the Massachusetts middle school would go home from school every day and chat in an AOL chat room about what happened, you know, who sat with who or, you know, whatever kids in middle school chat about. Um, and they noticed at one point that there was a lurker. There was somebody there listening and pay much attention if there was another kid. And then the lurker started to talk. And, the, and, and, and this, as this evolves, it's clear to them, clear to them, that this person is at the school because this person knows things. This person says things like, oh, Janie, you looked really neat in that purple sweater today. And oh, I saw you and you know, so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so sat together in the cafeteria. Yeah. So there's another kid in the, in, the, in the chat room. And it starts to get weird. And it starts to get really weird. And the person starts to become angry, and the kids start to be upset. It starts to get strange. It ultimately um, progresses to the point where, for example, that entrance to the school, person sends a picture of the entrance to the school with the, you know, the gun sight superimposed over it, um, sends a picture of the principal with bullet holes throughout, starts making ominous things. And now what has happened is that the kids have told their parents, and everybody's nuts. Everybody's going crazy because everybody believes, dear God, we're going to have another Columbine here, and who is it? It's got to be somebody in the school because they know everything that's going on, and this person is still, as this is going on, is still manipulating. So everybody's, everybody's trying to sort out. Parents are like, do I send the kids to school? Do I not send the kids to school? The parents are like, what do we do? Do we have security? Who do we have security from? Maybe it's one of us. How do we deal with this? Um, it goes on and on. At one point... I'm a serious lurker. The kids go back in the chat room and they say, we think you're Bobby Smith. Are you Bobby Smith? Because nobody liked Bobby Smith. And he said, yeah, I'm Bobby Smith. And so they beat the hell out of Bobby Smith. <laughs> of course, it wasn't Bobby Smith. I mean, Bobby just got in the way. It, it tracks on, and actually, they're very fortunate, very fortunate, um, by some kind of chance, some, some good luck, um, they find out who's doing it. And it's Christian Hunold, who's 20 years old, who is understandably, I mean, you know, you feel sorry for him. He'd, he'd been in an auto accident a couple years before. He'd been an athlete. He's now a paraplegic. He's bitter. And he's in Missouri. So Christian Hunold, 20-year-old uh, paraplegic from Missouri, is terrorizing a town in Massachusetts, playing with them, kind of like Sim City, only distorted, weird, whacked out Sim City. Sim City goes vicious. Uh, He's playing, with, he's playing with these people, and I mean, they were terrorized. And one of the things I find most interesting about this is that when they caught it, well, there's another dimension we'll talk about, is that when they caught him, he was getting ready to do it to another school in Georgia. Well, that was part of the problem. They found him. Massachusetts couldn't really prosecute him because they're, they're, they didn't have cybercrime code, they still had traditional criminal law, and they do now. I mean, <laughs> they dealt with that. Well, they can really prosecute him. Missouri could prosecute him because and one of the things he did, he sent the, the children child porn. He wasn't prosecuted on the federal level. You could, you could possibly get him on the federal level for transmitting threats. He wasn't prosecuted there. I think I know why. Missouri prosecuted him. He pled, you know, and then part of the problem is what do you do with him? Our penal systems are not set up to deal with people who are in Christian Hunol's situation. I mean, we don't really have the facilities. I think that's probably why the feds did not want to go after him. 
So he went away for a while. He's been let out, the usual restrictions on computers and all that. But look, this is one of the things. One sec. One second. This is one of the. This is one of the things that I like to talk about. I mean, the power. Christian Hunol could never have done this before. You can you can stalk a town before. You get this kid halfway across the country, sending this whole town into panic. He isn't prosecuted in Massachusetts. They fix their laws. He is prosecuted in Missouri, but for not very much. Uh, presumably, he won't be a recidivist. Um, they are, as I say, I think, pretty lucky that they caught him before he went after Georgia, because you have to understand, everybody in Massachusetts thought he was in this town. They weren't looking anywhere else, because how could it be some guy off in Missouri? Yes, sir. No, it was not. It was not then. We were not. We were not as sensitive. We were not as sensitive to terrorism. Now, there's, there's a thing you'll find in most states. There's an offense you'll find in most states that's been around for God knows how many long years. It's called making terroristic threats, and it's usually pretty small, pretty low level, pretty low level offense. You could use it, but it doesn't. It doesn't get you much. I mean, it, it goes back to this thing about harm. I mean, in Massachusetts, they wanted to get this guy because they are not happy about what had happened, but their laws really did not really did not work. I'm calling it stalking for lack of a better term. You know, I mean, he, he, did, he did make threats, um, which can make it a little different from some other kinds of cases. How am I doing on time? 29? Oh, good. Can I, can I tell a story? <laughs> this one, a variation of this one, he made threats. There's a case, do you know the Jake Baker case out of uh, Michigan, University of Michigan? Anybody know that one? Somebody knows that one. Um, Jake Baker, you can correct me if I uh, get anything wrong. Simplifying, Jake Baker was a student at Michigan. He was corresponding with another person. Um, slightly, I'm going to oversimplify and make it a little bit more internet public related than it is. He was corresponding with another person. Jake Baker lived in a dorm at the University of Michigan, and across the hall from him, for example, lived a woman for whom he conceived, as some people do, a very weird passion. Um, and Jake Baker, in the, in the course of his emails, described what he would like to do to her. And if you'd like to read what he'd like to do to her, send me an email and I'll send you the, the case. Among other things that he would like to do to her would be to strip her naked, hang her upside down by her feet, slash her with a knife, laughing while she screamed, pour gasoline over her, laughing while she screamed, and then do what? Light a fire, laughing as she screamed and died. Um, through a weird course of events, somehow, this apparently came to the attention, and there's a couple of things, there's a couple of women going on, there's a couple of dimensions, I mean, I'm simplifying because I don't have much time, it came to the attention of the woman, it's my understanding that the president of the University of Michigan just threw Jake Baker off campus after two hours, pardon, now, now, um, and then I think there was, like this, I think there was a discussion about, well, what do we do? We should charge him with something. We should prosecute him for something. What do we charge him with? He was prosecuted for what this one wasn't. He was prosecuted on the federal level for 18 U.S.C. Section 875C, which is using an instrumentality of interstate commerce to send threats. Did Jay Baker send threats? This guy did. I think this guy did with the bullet holes and the, you know, Yes! It's art. Yeah, he just expressed a fantasy, right? He never meant, I mean, I don't think he ever meant for her to see it. They're talking back and forth. It bleeds off into the, into the internet and she sees it. She was scared to death. But, but she, he didn't, huh? You don't think a jury would convict based on Ah, but you see, you see, this is why you hire, I, I've never been a prosecutor, I've been a defense lawyer. You hire defense lawyers, sneaky defense lawyers, um, and you get yourself charged with, you get yourself charged with this, you represent Jake Baker, Jake Baker comes in and you say, dear God, I don't want to go to a jury. This would not be good. Let's not go to a jury. Let's try to keep this thing from going to a jury. So you file a motion to dismiss the charges saying they're no good legally, which in this case would be, I'm the defense lawyer, I filed a motion, say what threat, right? Did he threaten anybody? No, no, you can't get there. If I, if I can convince the judge in the district court, the federal district court said, boy, I don't like this stuff, but he didn't threaten her. And the Sixth Circuit said, boy, I don't like this stuff, but it's not a threat. 
he didn't say to her, I am going to do this to you. He fantasized, and he put his fantasies featuring a real person out where she could find it. Yes? Oh, sure. You'd have to prove intent to threat. But see, really, you don't want to, you don't want to take this kind of case to a jury. <laughs> well, I mean, you hope, if you were to take a case like to the jury, you would hope they would do it right, you know, and parse through and say this, he didn't intend to and it wasn't a threat and all that, but you're much safer with a judge. And so this one, I mean, it's not up there. But the, the Baker one, I personally think very correctly, it wasn't a threat. I don't see how you could prosecute the guy for threatening. Yes? So you're saying he made, he, he put this in a publicly available space, like, you know, he, he wrote this up. So essentially, the same as he going to go forward and saying, I'd like to kill you in the ground. I mean, how about more like, I like it more. I think it would be interesting. Um, I had a cop several years ago ask me this scenario. It's kind of a variation. What if a guy, I have my, my weird passions being conceived again here, and I'm sorry, I'm thinking on the guys, other people can conceive weird passions, but whatever. Guy conceives a weird passion for this woman who lives in his apartment complex, and she doesn't like him. Um, you know, there's a lot of stalking cases where you get this kind of behavior. And so what he does is, if she walks back and forth, back and forth to her apartment, he videotapes her, and the officer's example, and I don't know if this was real or he made it up, the officer's example was that he morphs her head onto a, a videotape of somebody being raped and puts it on the internet. It's art. It's my creation. It's my homage. You're a star. Tune on. Come on, you can watch yourself being raped every day. Ain't that cool? He taped in public. It's not a commercial use. The, 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 this, by the way, this leads me to something which I wasn't going to get into today, but just as an aside, and at some point here I probably should get back on track. <laughs> um, invasion of privacy. I mean, we don't really treat, and I'm going to do this, I have a case on this one in a minute. We, we've not really treated a lot of things about ourselves and our identities, our privacy. We've not really taken that, we've not really taken that um, seriously. I mean, my question on that one with the, if you just take it on the straight criminal law perspective, if you did that and you put the videotape up and there's the videotape and now it shows her and it's characterized as art, is that different from Jake Baker, which isn't a threat. So let me, let me, bear with me, okay? Let me uh, struggle on something else that's vaguely related. You know this one? Do you know this site? Oh, this is such an interesting site. It's called the Nuremberg Files. Like you can see it here, visualize abortionists on trial. It's a, it's a website. There's the thingy. The address. It, it focuses, it posts the names, addresses, um, home and business, other information about doctors performing abortions. It doesn't say, go hurt them. But it does post that information. And in the section of the site, it lists the names of doctors. And if your name is listed in black font, you are alive and working. If your name is in a gray font, you've been wounded. If your name is structured, you've been killed. This caused consternation <laughs> to doctors who were listed on the site. You know, they thought, gee, I don't feel comfortable with this. Um, and so they brought a civil suit, the contours of which we don't worry about, but trying to get the site shut down. And they're saying that basically this is, what is this? Exactly. They're saying that it's a, th they're saying two things. They're saying it's a threat, threat. Um, how am I doing back there on my time? Okay, see, I, I'm the toe of all bad things will happen if I don't stay on time. Um, what you get here in terms, of, in, in terms of the issues, whether or not it's a threat, the, part of the argument was that it's threatening, that it's implicitly saying, hi, you know, that, that that is implicitly saying, we're threatening you. Another part of it is what's called aiding and abetting, which is somebody wants to rob a liquor store, I give them a gun, you know, I'm helping, I'm contributing. You know, the idea being that they're helping by saying, this is where you can find, this is where you can find the abortion doctors. Case goes, case goes to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, brought, brought, um, comes out of Washington, goes to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals um, says the rest of it, just the information that's posted, it's no problem. You can put up the abortion doctor's home address, work address, license plate number, spouse name, all those kinds of things, no problem. This, they said, was getting close to a threat. Now, 
Here's a really cool clone of that one called justicefiles.org. The front page of this website, this is from Justice Files. This is, uh, what it does is it provides name, salary, social security number, home address, spouses' names, kids' names, information about police officers. Well, now they, have, they started in Washington, and I'll tell you in a minute, they just won a court case, and I was looking at it this morning, and they say that by December they will have 23 million entries in their databases, searchable databases for law enforcement personnel, basically. The front page of the website says we are not encouraging anything. No, 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 no. We don't believe in anything bad happening to anyone. Please. But we want police to know that any time they have an encounter with a citizen, they can be held accountable. We think the public has the right to certain information about police so that if they have an encounter, they can be held accountable. I don't know what that means, but they're not encouraging anything wrong. This is from the site. Uh, Philip C. Gogwin is a Kirkland police uh, officer. This is straight from the site. This is a picture of his house. There's a map to his home. Um, you can find him. This causes police some discomfort. <laughs> Not happy with this. You know, they just don't like this. Um, so what happened is that Washington, Washington adopted a statute that, that said you could bring a civil suit if somebody posted information about law enforcement officers with intent to harm or intimidate. About two weeks ago, a federal court struck that down just like the Nuremberg Files, and said that violates the First Amendment. It's, they said it's not a threat. And so now our friend says he's going to have 23 million, he's going to have 23 million entries in it by the end of the year, and you can search and find whomever. He would like to take it national. Yes? In Washington, and we're leading about civil stuff, I don't do. In Washington, um, you can get the names of police officers. You can get the names of police officers, you find, out the police, you find out the officer's name, you find out the rank, you find out some other things. That is the other thing on the site. Everything here is public domain. Everything is public information. Everything is publicly gathered. He says now, with his 23 million, his database of 23 million entries, he wants to have a searchable database on various parameters so that you could find out anything you wanted to find. Well, not anything, but you could find out a lot about the people in somebody. Yes. It did. They were, ta they were taken down. There was a, a county court a challenge to the whole thing, and that judge said, not social security numbers. Basically, it's kind of an odd theory, but that they are not, you know, this is speech. The information is speech, but, they, but the, the social security numbers are more like a tool. They're not really speech. For, you know, I don't write these opinions. Um, now, with this, he says he's going to put social security numbers back up because he's, he says he's cleared. So this is, this is, one of my themes here, you know, power of different things happening, is this, this is a very passive kind of thing, but I don't, know that we can do much about this with our, our First Amendment, that it causes consternation and somebody had a hand up? If he, if he puts social security numbers, how's that like the California State Bill, Senate Bill 1386, which uh, restricts the uh, publishing of private personal information on the web to private like the in California? Well, you see, now that takes us to another thing, which was that in that interim when there was the Washington statute and they were trying to shut him down in Washington, what did he do? What did he do? He took it elsewhere. I mean, at that point, you would go to the Washington site and there wasn't anything on it. They say, go to one of our mirror sites, and by the way, if you'd like to mirror it, get in touch with me. I mean, before that, he'd been threatening to take it to Kuwait, so he takes it to Kuwait. Takes it to Kuwait, now what do we do? He takes it to Kuwait, he left Washington. I don't know if he went to Kuwait, but he took it to Kuwait, so now it's in Kuwait. Okay, great, what do we do about that? Let me, let me struggle onward here, because at some point they're gonna hold up their hands. Uh, Oh yeah, this one, this one, kind of a parenthetical, because this, this kind of fits in with that. Okay, let me, let me do this, because it really is relevant. Council of Europe, which is a cybercrime convention, which is the big attempt now to try to get consensus in laws across, cybercrime laws across countries, last year uh, adopted a protocol that criminalizes using computers to disseminate uh, racist and xenophobic material. Here it's material that targets race, ethnic, or national origins. I like the fact that it doesn't include gender or gender preference, but okay. Um, it has this, and it's a crime. 
specifically intended to target, for example, Holocaust denial sites, Nazi sites, things like that. This is going to be the flip side of Kuwait. So let me do this and we'll come back to Kuwait. Um, we can't do this. We opposed this. We didn't want this in the Council of Europe Convention in the first place. It is now in the, in the there's a now separate protocol. And we can't do this because of our First Amendment. For the same reason we have to let the Nuremberg files up and the Justice files up and other things. We host, you know, Holocaust denial sites, Nazi sites, different kinds of sites that people around the world find aggravating. And that causes a great deal of tension, has caused, is causing a great deal of tension with other countries, with Europe in terms of this, because they say, and this is something I always emphasize, you know, we're, we're sheltering these people. I say there's talk in that cybercrime havens. There is one cybercrime haven in the world right now, and it's us. And it's us in terms of this, because we have to protect speech, right? We have to allow this. I mean, at one point, I don't know if you saw, it was about a year ago, a year ago, a year and a half ago, Otto Schiele, who's a German minister of justice, for God's sake, um, wanted, uh, was proposing denial of service attacks on Nazi websites in our country to shut them down. Because, of course, we don't extradite. We can't extradite. It's not a crime here. So you, you, get, you get these tensions, which is leading me into, um, oh, yes, that's just people store records and things. I'm going to have to move on. Let me move on. All right. Quickly, real world crime, way, where our law enforcement system is set up, four assumptions. Physical proximity, I've got to be there to take your laptop, number one. Scale, limited scale. I take one laptop, I take another laptop, I can only do so much crime. Physical constraints, I take your laptop, you see me. I leave physical evidence, I can be traced. Patterns, you can, you can organize crimes into patterns. None of that's going to work for cyber crime. Our, our model of law enforcement is based on the idea that we have a transaction. You can identify that. You can find me. You're going to capture me. You're going to lock me up. I'm going to be locked up. All is well. Nobody else will ever do that again. Things will work nicely. Cybercrime doesn't work like that, as you know. Quote I like, in the network world, no island is an island. It doesn't make any difference. Kuwait. You can put the website in Kuwait. The Kuwaitis say, fine by us. <laughs> We don't like those American law enforcement people. It's not our problem. We don't have any laws on this. This isn't a crime here. Kind of the reverse of what we do with some of the German sites. Uh, Guzman, you know Guzman. I'm going to skip on. Whoa. Um, you know this case, right? Gorshkov and Ivanov? Gorshkov and Ivanov, the invite, I think. I don't imagine I have to go through the facts. You know the whole, you know, they put the keystroke logger on. They get the password, um, username and password. The FBI goes into the Russian computer, downloads files for uh, quite a long period of time, and don't get a warrant. So they're sucking information from a computer in another country back here with no warrant. Now, then they hold on to it. They get a warrant. And then, of course, the question becomes, these guys are going to move to suppress. Um, I'm, I'm here. They move to suppress and they say, hey, going into that computer and pulling those files back, copying those files, remember my seizure? Copying those files, taking those files, that's a seizure, and you, you had to have a warrant to do that. Oh, and by the way, you violated Russian law. Okay? The district court, which is not a model decision, is not a great decision, but we get decisions that aren't great sometimes. We have to keep trying. First of all, the court said the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply, and that's true. Our Supreme Court has said a long time ago that our Fourth Amendment is for we the people, not those people. We don't care about those people, okay? Just go do what you want to do. Our Fourth Amendment applies for us within our territorial boundaries, so the FBI could go into that Russian computer and violate the Fourth Amendment. I don't think that's a way to run a cyber world. From, that's an editorial, but that's where we are with, with the traditional. The court said there's no Russian law issue because basically, hey, it's not a basis to suppress here, right? Not our law. The court also said, this is another one I don't, I don't like any of this. Um, even if the Fourth Amendment applied, copying files is not a seizure because, hey, the stuff was still in Russia. So they lose, they lose on all of those. Now, I assume you know the next installment. Um, now, the, the, the FBI said the reason we did this is we went to the Russians and they wouldn't help us because there was no mutual legal assistance treaty in effect that encompassed it, so they wouldn't do anything for us. So we had no choice because these guys are victimizing American businesses, and we had to do something. We had to use what the law calls self-help. Uh, did you see this? 
Last August, the Russians charged one of the FBI agents with hacking. Charged in August, and the Russians said he's been charged with hacking, and um, gotcha. he's, been, he's been charged with hacking, and send him on down. Now, what do we do? Yeah. Right. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> Who? <laughs> and then in November, they said, "Hello, <laughs> we're waiting." He broke our law. He went into a computer system he wasn't authorized to go into. That's a crime. I can show you the statute. He broke the law. And that was in November. And what has happened? What, ha what are we going to do? Just do that. Not, 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 not us. I mean, it, it, huh? Well, there may be. See, what we're really doing, as I understand it, is we're just not thinking about it, which is kind of not, it's, we'll, someday maybe we'll get to that. My point on this, and I need to wrap up, my point on this, um, and I'm sorry I, I didn't get through, which I should go to, where, see I didn't get through many things, there we go, uh, this is my email address. Um, my point is, these and many other respects I didn't get to. Cybercrime causes problems, there's cross-border stuff, you have difficulties with the cross-border, we have trouble figuring out what our crimes are, we have problems figuring out crimes in different countries, we have cultural conflicts, we allow speech, other countries criminalize, and it's difficult, and I think that's enough. Right? Okay, we're done.